Number one, thanks for taking the time. Well, Dennis, I'm very honored and privileged that you gave me the invite. Nice to be here with you. Great. Um, there's a lot going on in a very short period of time between the pandemic, um, how we have this election in the first place, um, people's reaction to that while school school's starting. Um, do you want to wander into that space a bit? Like, this isn't a typical election at all, at all. What's that like on your end? Well, Dennis, you know, I guess I'm saddened uh, that we're having an election. Um, we and myself as the leader of the Liberal Party have publicly stated over and over again that we would not bring down the government uh, during the pandemic and uh, this year, and that tracks us out to March, in fact. And then we've also publicly stated that we would not cause an election again uh, should the pandemic still be ongoing in March. And um, so, you know, you've, we've all heard the Premier and uh, I think all the leaders will agree with them that the COVID-19 committee was working very well. Um, we've frequently heard them com compliment uh, how well it was working and how well the province has been doing. So why we're having this election at this time, um, I know, uh, you know, my mom is 93 and she lives at a residence with other elderly people. They're stressed about this. I know many parents from traveling around the province and speaking with them are very stressed about the reopening of school. And then, of course, you know, we have uh, the possibility of a second wave on the go. And I think, you know, our, our focus uh, should have been there during this past uh, few weeks. But here we are. Uh, tied up and traveling the province with regards to a to a uh, an election, which I I just feel that uh, is on and on and on needed, and you know I guess you know, lastly um, it it does put people at risk. You know we met the COVID nineteen committee and we agreed that municipal elections, for example, would be put off till next year, and uh, that was our position. And but here we are, uh, you know a good. Uh, eight months before the municipal elections will take place, uh, having a provincial election, it doesn't make any sense. And, uh, but anyway, that's, that's reality and here we are. Yeah, here we are. Um, sort of a fun question, does your mom vote for you? Yeah, she, she <laughs> for me, she's 93. She's even uh, participated in a, uh, an advertisement uh, that we did as well as my granddaughter. So uh, I have uh, both ends of the spectrum covered. Great. Um, partly why I ask, it's not unusual in some families when there's more um, political choices. I'm a Quebec boy by birth, so it's like breathing that you have all these choices in families with all these different points of view, and, and they have these amazing conversations around their supper table. I just wondered if you had that in your world, too. We always did. You know, I think uh, growing up on the Maramachi, uh, you know, that's part of the part of the uh, summertime conversation, uh, politics, and what's good for the province. So I, I, I grew up with that. And um, I, I, you know, firmly believe that uh, public service and, and, and commitment to public safety in my part, you know, I spent all my life keeping people safe as a, as a police officer and then as a, a sergeant at arms in Parliament Hill. Uh, it's uh, innate with me to to be thinking and be concerned of our public and, and giving myself to public service. So uh, this is one last crack of the bat, uh, Dennis, and I'm hoping to hit a home run for New Brunswick. Great. A oh, good tagline. Maybe we'll pull that and use it. <laughs> There's, uh, it's been an unusual stretch with the minority government. Um, can you share what it was like on the inside? Uh, New Brunswick did something unusual um, two years ago with voting for a minority. And it takes a while to get the wheels up and running and everybody figuring out how this is gonna work. Um, you wanna to speak to what that was like for you? Uh, and you know, as leader of the party, you know, I came in uh, a good, uh, you know, eight months or so after that minority government was elected. I had been serving as the ambassador of Canada in Ireland and uh, came home here to New Brunswick and uh, found myself as the leader of the Liberal Party. And, but no, you know, I think for the most part, uh, it's, you know, it serves the residents very, very well. Um, you always have to respect the uh, wishes and the desires of the population and the, the population spoke. They, they were not prepared. 
last election to give anyone a clear majority. And uh, there's so I believe there's an expectation on the part of the public that we work uh, together collaboratively. But, you know, I think there's the reality too. We, we live in a Westminster democracy and uh, that democracy demands, uh, that, you know, a government and, and a responsibility to the official opposition to oppose. So in a minority situation, that makes those ideals very challenging because we do have a role to play keeping the government to account uh, even in a minority government uh, situation and i think this probably falls and leads to uh, you know the the uh, last meetings we had with the party leaders to try to mr higgs wanted a mandate from us to uh, proceed for the next two years prior to uh, before calling an election and we just found that he what his plans were and the issues that he wanted to address were just too far sweeping um, for minority government. The people in New Brunswick didn't give him, uh, his government, uh, a mandate for these issues. And essentially he was looking for a you know, majority government power, even though he was in minority government with uh, a surrendering of the opposition's roles, which we just didn't feel was appropriate nor correct in a, in a democracy. And that, that is the reason why we're, we're the position that we took, for sure. And a couple of by-elections hanging in the winds, um, waiting to happen. Yeah, you know, and uh, the elections officer, Kim Poffineroff, uh, you know, she uh, testified before the um, committee at, at the legislature. And that was one of her wishes, if, if we could have just proceeded with those by-elections, um, she would have been able to establish uh, best practices and safe procedures uh, for the general election. Mm -hmm. So now that we're into the election period and you've been rolling out your platform, um, I had a question that sort of pops up. It's like when you listen in the coffee shops and on the street and they'll go, well, how did they get there from where they were over here? And an example might be the glyphosate vote. So in the legislature, minority government um, votes taken on a bill put out by the Green Party, I believe, and um, it was lost. But in your election platform, it's um, announced that you'll be looking to reduce the use of glyphosate in the province. Do you, do you want to speak to that so the general public will get what the rationale was behind yeah, the shift? This, is, this has always been a very controversial issue within our, within our caucus. Uh, you can well imagine that a good number of our MLAs uh, are in riding where forestry is uh, front and center and have, have concerns there. But I think Alex or Dennis, this is what I bring to the table as the ambassador of Ireland in Canada, like I was in Ireland, but I witnessed all the countries banning glyphosate, uh, Luxembourg, uh, Belgium, uh, Austria, uh, France, Italy, um, uh, transitioning away. Germany just announced that it is uh, transitioning away. So I'm, I'm, I'm able to give that perspective. Like, you know, if countries like Australia and, and all these European countries are doing it, they're doing it for a reason. And uh, they're not just doing it for the sake of doing it. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, there's concerns here. We see the uh, owner uh, of glyphosate has put significant sums of money away for liability. They've already paid out a number of liability cases in the United States, and we see a class action lawsuit here in Canada. But I think, Dennis, for me, this is about our children and our grandchildren, and. Uh, I'm not prepared to take chances or roll the dice uh, uh, on their well-being and the environment that we want to leave them. Um, it's 2020, and I don't believe we should be spraying chemicals in our forest. To tidy up a loose end around that, it was from a Facebook post that I read yesterday after the announcement about the Liberal platform and, and getting rid of glyphosate. Someone did a historical piece saying, okay, we started with DDT uh, 50, 60, 70 years ago. Then we banned DDT, but another chemical came in and took its place. And in his post, he had three different iterations of we ban something, but something else comes and takes its place. So he was doing that continuum argument that, well, is there another chemical that's going to come afterward? It might be the window of time we're in, because you mentioned 2020, that it's time to start doing things differently on many different levels. So in connection with that gentleman's query about, oh, is something else just gonna take its place so you can safely ban glyphosate because you know this other chemical is gonna come in over here? Or do we go back to expanding the silviculture program? Because once upon a time, we had a lot of people working in the woods. 
Well, you know, I, I, I don't think there's any one silver bullet uh, on these issues. Um, and, and you're right, my reading of the literature, there'd be something like 24, 26 other chemicals that could replace glyphosate tomorrow uh, that exist and are, that are being sold uh, in the market. So really, you know, whatever legislation that we do bring in is going to have to have a wider scope, uh, probably, uh, you know, covering herbicides in a more general nature um, with an including of, including of, but, you know, uh, you'd never be able to keep up with it either, uh, you know, the, the manufacturers uh, changing chemicals or whatever to, to uh, fit. So it, it, it'll be a real challenge coming up with a, with a piece of legislation that ensures the, the, uh, the use of chemicals uh, in our uh, forest. And, you know, we have to realize that, you know, we, and I say, I use the word pragmatic, uh, you know, being smart about this, we can't destroy our economy at the same time either. We need our economy to support our healthcare system, uh, to look after our weak, our vulnerable, and, and our needy in society. But you know, we do know that glyphosate is used, uh, uh, you know, in the agricultural, you know, agriculture industry uh, extensively. You know, uh, you know, you know, corn crops and wheat crops out west, uh, the Roundup or glyphosate is a, is a chemical that's being used. So, you know, I, I think we have to be pragmatic and, but, and be smart. And I guess that's why I differ from the Greens. Uh, they're calling for an immediate ban. Uh, our, our ban is saying transition over four years to give companies and industry a strategy to go forward and how to deal with and the option that you just raised there, uh, silver culture and having employees and what types of um, uh, employees we would you know, hire to, to do this, uh, that's all going to be part of the, the equation. That speaks to a, um, a connected theme, which would be our economy and how our economy impacts our environment. And you just spoke to a piece of that, which then can weave in farming, we can weave in uh, mining. So Herb Emery, a UNB prof economist, um, has this vision about all the lost money on the table from lost investments and uh, was quite pointed in who he wanted to hold responsible for that. And RPC came up with a map of all the mining potential in the province. And at the same time, if you took a map of all the waterways in the province, you can easily see there's going to be some pretty intense conversations about water conservation as opposed to economic drivers based on mining or industry. Um, minority governments give you the opportunity to, to dance that differently than if someone's in power. Um, do you want to speak to that? Because we're on the cusp of the change in 2020. We need to shift how we do things. And the key to that is politically and the shared decision making. So can you wander into that? Because the minority government sort of took pressure away or took their authority away from some of the backroom people who aren't elected, who have influence. And we're in a new space now when you have the chance to explore it a different way. Yeah, Does that you make know, sense? Can you kind yeah, of no, I'm going? I think I hear you. you. You know, one of the things I worry about, Dennis, is our province, you know, and I guess it's a fact, uh, we're, we're very divided. Uh, I really, really feel passionate. And that's one of the reasons I became leader and uh, want to become premier. Is I want to bring everybody together, you know, north, south, east, west, uh, francophones, uh, anglophones, and most importantly for me, I've spent my life with First Nations people. Uh, I, I want them at the table. And I want them to feel included in our uh, decision-making process as we go forward on on these issues. I think it's central that uh, we're we're together, uh, working together to ensure that uh, decisions that are made are are good for all New Brunswickers. You know, I publicly stated now that I would unilaterally go out and, and uh, have a First Nations person at the cabinet table. I, I want the First Nations people in cabinet uh, from the get-go on all these issues that you just mentioned so that they have a voice uh, and we can hear loud and loud and loud and clear. Um, you know, as well, you know, instead of tackling these issues and coming, butting heads with one another, I've always found it useful, you know, uh, having an overall strategy, a long-term vision plan. And, you know, if parties could get together and, and work on a, on a template, um, guiding principles for a long-term vision plan and have meaningful input, 
uh, and collaborative input into a long-term vision plan, uh, you know, on, on issues that you that you just raised, I think that would be a, a real, real stepping stone uh, in the right direction that we would be able to have a, have a shared vision as to where the province uh, should go. Yesterday, I had opportunity to interview um, three of your candidates in the Fredericton area, Nicole Picot and Chris Duffy and Stephen Horseman. And it was lovely. I was grateful they could take the time. But somewhere in our conversation as we wandered, I made a, a light joke saying, sounds like the Liberals are going back to being liberal and the Conservatives now have to come up with their framing. And just what you described triggered that for me and made me think, yes, it, it's like you're almost going back to your roots. So can you play with the space of a, a clear distinction that seems to be emerging between a liberal strategy and a conservative strategy? Because it has a different feel to it now. Yeah, you know, you know, on the economic sense, and uh, you know, I, I get criticized. I'm not political. You know, I I, I tend to be um, open-minded about other parties and other leaders. And working the COVID nineteen committee is, is you know just confirmed to me that you know the other leaders of this province, the political parties, love this province just as much as I do. Uh, they're passionate in Brunswick. They're giving selfless, selflessly of themselves, um, each of them, uh, to the good of the province and uh, their convictions as to how to move the province forward in, 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 a, in a, uh, the best manner for everyone. And I, I salute each and every one of them uh, for that, uh, Dennis. But yeah, it, it comes back down to the philosophies and the values of how, how the party is. And, you know, on the economic uh, side, uh, liberals tend to be very Keynesian. Uh, they, they believe that the government has a role and can give a helping hand to business and facilitate uh, business and has a role to play to invest. And that is especially uh, right now where we have the single largest contraction of our economy in our provinces and our country's history. So we would see this as, you know, a you know a crucial time for government to step forward and, and play a key role in investing in the economy and to ensure that uh, small businesses uh, continue and those jobs are those jobs are, are are saved and going forward you know we would be very much you know when we look at the debt and the deficit uh, our thoughts and philosophy would be going forward with growing the economy, making the economy prosper. And where uh, Premier Higgs, uh, as we all know, uh, his path is one of cuts and austerity. He believes that being conservative, <laughs> being, being very conservative uh, would be his, his path. So people have a choice. Like, you know, there's that path of, of cuts and austerity or the provincial government and collaboration with the federal government investing and um, uh, helping the marketplace and the economy uh, in this in this re, in this recovery. Um, again, I don't want to sound political here, but you know, of all the provinces uh, during this pandemic, both uh, on a economic basis but uh, on a per capita basis, New Brunswick has done the least to invest in helping small, medium-sized enterprises uh, get through this uh, get through this crisis and. We think that's a mistake. Uh, we, we believe it's a lot easier to ensure the survival of a company than see them fall and then start all over again with new startups. It's, it's a real, a real challenge. And last thing, last thing, just one last thing there. Um, the, the Liberal government or Liberal Party traditionally has a, a real emphasis on our weak, our vulnerable, and our elderly. Um, you know, I, I was in Moncton last week and. You know, I made a commitment that um, should I be, when I become premier, that I will uh, look after the homeless uh, issue in this province over the course of the next four years. That we really need um, aggressive, robust uh, investment by government, federal government, provincial government, uh, to get those without homes uh, a bed and a shelter. That's fundamental, and, and you know, it, it, it's proactive in addressing so many issues such as mental health and, and drug addiction. One of the economic drivers that might suit New Brunswick well is um, 
local communities uh, having better access to high-speed internet, which would then foster the network or infrastructure they need for being competitive. I've had the pleasure of so many interviews over the past seven years, and between the lines, the pictures emerge from this piece and this piece and this piece wants to fit together. And, and maybe an election window is a time to say we can get at regional development a slightly different way where we're giving a bit more autonomy at the grassroots level. We're giving you the infrastructure tools like a high-speed internet. That, uh, and they have the solutions to their own problems as opposed to governments going to come in and, and do that. Can you speak to that a little bit? Because the traditional pattern is to support industry. Industry puts a factory or something in an area. And three or four years later, we're kind of back where we started. Um, and then can you tie that to food? Because we, we import 90% of our food and there's got to be a window. There's over a million acres that aren't being used right now. You've got an aging population in, in our farming community. Um, we're talking about bringing in more. You made an announcement about bringing in more people to the province. And, and the pleasure of sitting in this chair is all these different conversations. But the frustration of sitting and doing this show is uh, I feel uh, alone at times that can they not see this? Can they not see that? And politics becomes a place where that can all come together. Dennis, yeah, Dennis, listen, uh, you, I want to compliment you on, on identifying the, the issues. Um, just a few weeks ago, I have a friend of mine, he, the bank of the governor of London, of the United Kingdom, Mark Carney, he's a Canadian, and uh, I knew Mark here in Ottawa, but. I was discussing with him just these very issues that you just spoke about, but on the importance of high-speed internet, you know, Mark said to me, like Kevin, um, New Brunswick was always seen as a rural, isolated area, but Kevin, with COVID-19, the world has become an isolated regional area. And the way the world's gonna function going forward is doing what we're doing right now uh, as with uh, Zoom, which didn't exist a couple of years ago, uh, is high-speed internet. So he was counseling me that probably the most single important thing that we could do for our province is to ensure that we have high band uh, internet, uh, high-speed internet service across the, across the province. And I, you know, uh, will work and uh, I'm passionate about this that to, Work with the federal government to find the necessary resources to ensure that the province is blanketed in high-speed internet. And you know, people think of that as a really big challenge. But you know, I've seen Premier McNeil in Nova Scotia just the other evening, and they're 97 percent of the way there in, uh, in in Nova Scotia. So we certainly can do it here in uh, in New Brunswick. Um, you know, COVID-19 I think probably kind of shook the world and made us think about. Um, you know, food safety and, and uh, having enough food, uh, you know, to feed ourselves. Obviously, and as you mentioned, there's so much uh, land available here in New Brunswick that presently is unproductive. So we really have to double our efforts teaching children in school the importance of food uh, and careers in food. And I mean, you know, you talk to people like Mr. John Bragg, in the blueberry, blueberry industry. Um, there, there's just so many opportunities here. You know, uh, we have our friends uh, actually from India, over in Bhaktush now, that have, are, are going gangbusters on growing apples. Uh, 600 acres of apples over there that uh, they're shipping around the world, but particularly to, to India. And it's an ideal climate uh, for the growth of apples. And, you know, stuff, stuff that we never even thought of and never even, uh, you know, uh, he, he saves grain to save, he tells me, $10,000 a tractor truck load uh, shipping from Bucktoosh to New York versus where his other orchards are out in the Okanagan Valley of British Columbia and, and in Washington. So there's all kinds of opportunities there. But, you know, one of the things that New Brunswick really was successful going back, uh, you know, decades now, but that my father, Bill Vickers, started the Northumberland Co-op Dairy in uh, Miramichi with, you know, I think six or seven employees. And that, that co-op uh, grew to be, you know, the largest, uh, most modern milk manufacturing facility, uh, you know, basically in the land of Canada. And the co-op movement is people coming together, uh, working together, 
uh, for the good of one another. And in that co-op movement, there's things such as, you know, education and caring, you know, reaching out and caring for one another. It's really a, a family philosophy of, of, of working. And, you know, I think there's opportunities for us to start re-examining where we are and going down those roads. You know, I, um, you know, I often wonder, like woodlot owners, why, why could they not form a co-op and run their own, uh, you know, woodlot business? And this again would go to larger issues of chemical use, and, and but I, I just see so much potential there uh, if, again, coming together and, and working cooperatively uh, will be would be a, a great. Uh, step towards that goal of uh, food independence. Great, and thanks for this. Um, a friend of mine once taught me that, uh, Dennis, New Brunswick's built on three Fs, forestry, fishing, and farming. So a lot of attention on forestry and fishing and the farming conversation kind of it faded away. So it's nice to hear it's coming a bit more to the forefront in larger scale. Yeah, and you know, Dennis, I, uh, you know, we, we those are, traditional industries here, but, you know, I'm, again, I think I bring to the tables, you know, a, a different view. Um, I have passionate about transforming the economy of the province of New Brunswick, and I've been using those words uh, repeatedly, and people will say, Kevin, how are you going to do that? And I tell them, uh, by having a specific focus on three trending emerging sectors, uh, technology slash cybersecurity. There's going to be 3 million new jobs worldwide, 3 million new jobs worldwide by 2024 in cybersecurity. And Fredericton, right here, we, up until the last few years, we really had a great reputation and a great cyber footprint. So we, you know, I've now have a candidate at Normal Linton, Steve Burns, uh, and Steve's a young executive who uh, is committed to uh, reviving and putting Fredericton back on the map with, with that. So that's, that's one of the areas. The other one is the green economy and uh, attracting business in wind, solar, and building on this tidal, tidal powers as well. But Dennis, there's an initiative going on down in Southern New Brunswick, which is quite advanced. And you're gonna see a large federal government uh, investment uh, down, down the road here very shortly. Uh, small modular nuclear reactors. Uh, and these reactors are not thermal reactors. These, you know, we are always, it always scares us when we hear the word nuclear. Uh, these are reactors that, that literally can fit in the back of a tractor trailer truck and run a large city um, for several years. And uh, the waste that they produce is minimal and can be reused uh, back into the, to the reactor. And when you look at um, countries like India and China, where they're bringing on two new coal-fired electric generation stations a month, um, we can see, you know, our children and grandchildren are doomed unless we come up with an alternative. And I see these small modular nuclear reactors as an alternative to that. Um, so, and the market would be unlimited. Uh, you know, we could, we could uh, these things could be quickly manufactured right here in New Brunswick, places like Craig Manufacturing up in Heartland, Sunny Corner, Mechanical and Marmashi, <coughs> excuse me, MQM and Dragody. There are all kinds of companies uniquely positioned to help us manufacture these things on a, on a large scale. So um, I see this as a once in a generation opportunity for New Brunswick and a chance really for New Brunswick to save the world from climate change. Um, we, we uh, have an opportunity right here as New Brunswickers to, uh, to grab onto this. And we're looking at <clears throat> 10,000 direct jobs and 40,000 indirect jobs uh, in the manufacturing of, of, of these uh, units. So um, this is something that I'm, I'm, I'm promoting. Um, and I, I, when I'm premier, I'll, I'll certainly uh, uh, continue to promote because I really feel it is uh, a way out of the climate change uh, crisis that we're in and both bringing hope and opportunity for our province and the creation of thousands of jobs. Do you have any thoughts of how solar also plays into that? Because it seems obvious from a lot of the yeah. experts that we can't do just one <clears throat> thing. We have to do several things yeah. kind of at the same time. Yeah, you know, you hear, hear people like Bill Gates and, you know, and I think everybody, and, and uh, you know, I salute the Green Party and, and their goal of uh, 
renewable energy, um, you know, solar, uh, wind, um, you know, and tidal, you know, that, that goal, you know, I'm 100% with them on that. But the reality is, is that it will never get us to where we need to be as far as energy sources go. Um, you know, it's just not practical, especially in the climate dear old New Brunswick's climate here with, uh, with the foggy days and the cloudy skies and the snowstorms. Uh, yeah. It's just not a, it's just not a, it's just not a practical thing. And as I say, you hear people like Bill Gates uh, speak out and say, um, it would be a big mistake to think renewables is the only solution uh, we have to have. And this is where I, I feel strongly about this Momazo or nuclear reactors filling that gap. But I, I think we should always strive to try to get there uh, to as much renewable energy as possible. Okay. We have about five minutes left and I'd like to touch on uh, one more theme and then um, let you sign off the way you would like, <laughs> like to <laughs> sign off. Uh, a hot issue just before the election was closing of some of the smaller regional hospitals. Um, do you want to wander into that a little bit? Because it, it, from the circles I have opportunity to be in, it's clear that some smaller hospitals need to be closed and replaced with another form of healthcare delivery. An interview with John McGarry some four years ago, um, he taught me well during that conversation about New Brunswick, well suited for regional healthcare delivery. And along the way comes closing some of the smaller hospitals, replacing it with healthcare clinics and becoming more efficient on certain surgeries in certain locations. And yes, it does involve some travel for people, but it's uh, elective as opposed to critical. Um, and then every time a government tries to make that shift, um, it runs into the grassroots resistance that hospital equals healthcare. So there was the particulars of St. Stephen or Sussex that we went through, but there's also the general themes about how do we get the province to shift that you're actually going to be better off with some changes. And it seems constant that um, people will say, I wasn't included in the conversation. Uh, Dennis, it's great. Uh, and and, the, and uh, your comments, I guess it's a matter of thinking. And um, let me start on something totally different with regards to small rural hospitals. New Brunswick has an aging population. And uh, it's aging quickly and, and demographically, we're probably the fastest trending uh, aging society in, in Canada. So we have to attract population, we have to attract investment, we have to grow our economy. And central to that economic piece, central to that economic piece, if you take a place like Sackville, for example, or uh, St. Anne de Kent, or up in Perth Handover, People will not go to those communities, nor will companies invest in those communities, unless they have a regional health service right there. I've talked to uh, numerous uh, people that have resettled in Sackville, and the number one reason they decided to go to Sackville was because it had a community hospital that provided the services that it did. That was their, that was their reason. That, so I see these hospitals that people are talking about is central to my economic development plan. These are the nuggets that will accommodate and facilitate investment and growth of population in those communities. And if you remove that hospital or you remove those services from those hospitals, you will, in fact, be a death sentence for those communities. Because, you know, why go to Sackville? You know, well, I'll go to Moncton. Uh, why, would I, why would I live in Sackville if I'm 80 and I have a heart condition? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go to Moncton. So I see this, you know, as a crucial economic development piece in our thinking to go forward. The other interesting thing about this, a lot of it is, as you know, the conversation is about the, the expense of healthcare. But I did the math on the closure of the emergency room services from midnight to eight in those areas, you know, and basically there would have been the savings of anywhere between 4.5 to $6 million by closing those, which is like half of 1% of our total healthcare budget. So that's it. Another little bit of thinking here, and this is recent thinking, Italy now has come out and said like, you know, where did we go wrong in COVID-19? How did, how did it happen that we got ourselves in the mess that we have 
and and the 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 pain that we felt with COVID nineteen in Italy, and what they're coming out with was our mistake was our thinking that large regional centers would be much more effective and efficient than having population dispersed dispersed going to smaller healthcare facilities. So that's another piece of the another piece of uh, another piece of the, the pie. Dennis, you know, I was a Mountie, 29 years uh, in the RCMT, and uh, uh, I can tell you as a first responder that, uh, you know, uh, you have a, a burst artery or you have a, uh, a crisis at a car accident scene, uh, and even things such as, you know, heart attacks, uh, time is um, the absolute critical essence. Uh, your life is, is Safety, and I've gone back now. I've seen where over the last six years, those are listed uh, health facilities have resuscitated over 200 New Brunswickers during that during that uh, period of time. So it's not that I'm against change, but I think there's other arguments and other pieces of thinking, such as the economic development piece uh, going forward that I would I will consider, uh, and that's why I'm so convinced and entrenched. Uh, not not on not on the arguments of the benefits of, of health, but having a measured approach, balanced between health and growing our economy, attracting a population and attracting investment. Great, thank you for that. Um, if it's okay, what you just said triggered another little thought. Um, the paramedic uh, revision that happened, um, the issue of language when it comes to healthcare services, um, and then the balance of um, risk based uh, language, access to uh, my language, or access to healthcare. Um, so it was a hot item two, three, you know, two years ago, 18 months ago. Um, the public struggled into that whole paramedic issue and the ability to gain employment there. I did a bit of research on uh, what they did in Quebec, and I know the dynamics are slightly different, but they ended up deciding that healthcare is priority over language rights. New Brunswick has got slightly different foundation, but the human experience <laughs> still wanders into that space. And when you mentioned the, you know, the need for time, you need to react quickly to serve these things. Um, and I know it's a bit more awkward kind of space to walk into, but we, we're going to have to walk into it one day with how this is going to fit and evolve. If you're willing, do you want to walk into that a bit, what your thoughts are on that? You know, I'm going to tell you a story that I hope addresses your question. Um, I was in Alberta as a RCMP officer. My career was essentially dead because I was not bilingual and I could not come home to New Brunswick because it was a bilingual province and without having both official languages, I just could not get transferred back to uh, New Brunswick. But long story short, Dennis, Herculean, Herculean efforts. Uh, I've got to myself where now I'm exempted. I'm completely bilingual, but back in the day, Having done that and, and having a six, well, I got to come home to New Brunswick after 25 years in the RCMP, and I was stationed in Tracadie. In Tracadie, I, I small community up the Cape Peninsula. I was inspector in charge of that region. But one Friday evening, driving home to Miramichi, uh, right in front of me, a car hit a moose, and it was a horrible collision. And the car veered into the into the forest, uh, deep snow, maybe 150 feet or whatever. And, uh, I was inspector, so I, you know, I called the ambulance service, I called the general duty RCMP officers. And having done that, I had waded through the snow. And when I got to the car, there was a young Francophone boy there. He was eight years old and crying. And I crawled into the car and his father was there and he was dying, his head on the steering wheel. I was able to speak to him in French, and I, I, you know, I spoke to him, I, telling him, you know, so it's going to be okay. Uh, the RCMP and the ambulance are on the way, but I knew, I knew that he was dying. But that last minute or two of his life, I was, I communicated to him in his language, and then it probably took about 15 minutes or so for the ambulances and the police to arrive. But I was there alone with that young boy, being able to speak to him in his second language. Dennis, this is what it's all about. It's about respecting the dignity of people. That, this, is, this is what this conversation is about. And I think, you know, man oh man, we're gonna have problems with bilingualism. We're gonna have all these talks, but at the end of the day, Dennis, 
It's about respecting the dignity of women. And my goal is to bring the province together so that we can go forward working on this issue. And I know we can do it. We're, we, you know, it, it, this is, you know, we can all have these arguments. Is it fair? Is it right? Is it just or whatever? Yeah. At the end of the day, let's let's get at it. We're official bilingual province. Let us be a beacon for our country. Let us be a beacon for the world. Let us show the world that we can do this together. Yeah. And thank you for that. Past conversations, Jean-Marie Nadeau, past president of Société des Acadiens Nouveau-Brunswick. And uh, it was at the time of the busing, the English-French buses issue. And I, I couldn't resist framing it for him. It's like, what's up with New Brunswick, man? It's like 1% or uh, 1 degree of separation. Like we're all connected in this. Second you meet someone, within three minutes, you figured out who you know in common. But you make it about busing or you make it about healthcare or education and something happens and that gets lost. And he kind of smiles and smirks and goes, you know what I do? I would take all the English kids from St. John and send them up to Bathurst for a summer. And I would take all the kids in Bathurst and send them in St. John for the summer. Like, like his, he wasn't, uh, no animosity. Like he knew what the solution was, which is getting to know each other, which is similar to your thing. Dennis, you're, you're, you're stealing some of my policy, or he's, he's already thought of my <laughs> policy. Dennis, I'm going to do that. That's how we're going to correct this thing. I'm going to put a program in place where kids from Karaket can go down and spend two weeks in Minto, and kids in Minto can go to Karaket and spend two weeks. We've got to do this. Generations, like, you know, we've grown up with these entrenched thoughts uh, on this issue, but and the only way we're going to correct it is we get our children together. And I know, just as your friend has, has stated, if we can uh, get French kids, Francophone kids with Anglophone uh, families uh, from north down to the south, be it St. John, wherever, and vice versa, kids from St. John going up and spending a couple of weeks at Maisonette, a beautiful beach off of Karaket, um, we're, we're gonna do this thing. And people say, well, if it's been 50 years. Well, listen, 50 years is nothing. It's, it's <laughs> nothing. And we really got to continue, Dennis, to, to, uh, to strive for this. Um, you know, again, it's, it's respecting the dignity of one another. Um, we, we can do better. We're New Brunswickers, and uh, it's who we are. And look at, you know, the First and Second World War. Um, we, we fought alongside one another uh, for, for the good of our province and the freedom of our country. And, like we just have so much here to get tied up in, into, uh, you know, singular thoughts that, you know, we have to become more, more inclusive. We have to come together. We have to work together. Yeah. Final thoughts? Well, listen, it's been a wonderful conversation. I'm uh, looking forward to my first political debate tonight on, yes. on TV <laughs> with, uh, with, uh, with Rogers. And uh, I tell no, you- No, it's a non-contact sport, right? <laughs> it's it's a daunting daunting thought like all my opponents uh, my political opponents you know they've been at this now for years i'm premier higgs 10 years i think mr coon likewise and yeah. i'm a real uh, novice in, on on all this political stuff but as i've done today i'm just going to go in there and and speak from my heart and uh, and uh, hope that new brunswickers have confidence in me and my experiences in life uh, to allow me the privilege of being their next premier and that way I can bring hope and opportunity, and as I say, transform our economy for the good of New Brunswick. Thank you. God bless. Take care. Much appreciated. Yeah. Good luck tonight. Thank you.